paper is by um, David Vecchi from Slot Machines to Pan Genomes on the Role of Biological Metaphors in the Study of Culture. So I, first of all, I'm a philosopher. Second, I'm Italian. Third, I work in Chile. Um, so you'll see that uh, the reference to the fact that I'm Italian is relevant because I'm going to talk about food a lot. And as every Italian, uh, well, I don't know if you happen to know Italians, but Italians are quite uh, peculiar about food, and that is going to be part of my presentation. So um, pan genomes and slot machines are just uh, two of the various metaphors that have been used uh, to, let's say, uh, understand biological phenomena in general. Uh, science is full of metaphors, and Michael Brady is quite an expert on the use of metaphors in biology in particular. In particular. But, you know, uh, it's enough to talk about uh, the cut and the use of the machine metaphor and uh, the actual use uh, of the metaphor in uh, modern synthetic biology in order to grasp, uh, you know, the, the meaning of uh, uh, what a metaphor or an analogy could be. But I'm going to talk about the analogy that uh, um, was introduced in the previous um, presentation without slides by... Uh, Natalie, uh, I'm going to talk about trial and error uh, or blind variation and selective retention that was, uh, um, you know, thought to be by many people uh, like a universal metaphor for any kind of evolutionary process, be it biological or cultural, it doesn't make any difference. And I'm going to, uh, well, I'm going to demolish every aspect of uh, uh, the beliefs that are uh, implicit in, the, in this uh, big metaphor by focusing on, uh, on biology uh, and modern biology in particular, and modern genom contemporary geno genomics and uh, microbiology. So um, what was uh, uh, the idea of trial and error? First of all, that variation is not Lamarckian, so it's completely blind, and uh, it was very difficult to establish what it meant to be blind, but you know, the idea is that it, was, it is not more probable to be beneficial uh, than neutral, deleterious. Uh, the second idea was about inheritance, and uh, the idea is that trials are retained uh, only vertically. So there is a negation of uh, basically lateral uh, transfer of information or, you know, genetic and phenotypic information. And the third idea was that selection was the only explanation of design. So why I say this, not because it's my idea, but because modern biology says this. And, uh, so the idea of blindness, this is the first reference to food. Um, I call it an example of compositional cultural evolution in the sense that this is a spaghetti fork that, uh, you know, some people who are definitely not Italian uh, try to use, and it's a fork with a mechanism on top, a rotating mechanism that, you know, supposedly help. Uh, people, it doesn't really help because I tried it, but uh, you know, it's uh, the idea that you know, applied to culture that blindness doesn't really uh, work, uh, com you know, complete blindness. The idea of blindness, uh, you know, uh, was purely epistemological in uh, Darwin's case, but it became, the, uh, it became an established uh, feature of biological uh, science thanks to another Italian, uh, Salvador Luria, uh, who in his autobiography explains why he came up with the idea of random variation. And it was, uh, funnily enough, in a casino, uh, uh, looking at a, a friend of his who was um, you know, using a slot machine. So in doing so, it dawned on me that slot machines and bacterial mutations have something to teach each other. So why I talk to, uh, about bacterial mutations? Just because since 1988, that is uh, 45 years after this accident uh, happened in the casino, I don't know where it was, in Atlantic City, I think, in the States, uh, uh, it was uh, sort of established that there are adaptive uh, phenomena in, uh, in bacteria, and in the last uh, 25 years, 2000, yes, 25 years, uh, it's been established that, uh, you know, uh, there is a direct, directionality in the mutation as far as definitely time of occurrence is concerned, genomic site, 
sometimes rate of occurrence. And uh, recently, it's been established that, uh, as a matter of fact, there is also something more. You know, uh, this is the first uh, example, and maybe the only one, of a truly Ramarkian system known, and I make reference directly to uh, an article by Conin and Wolf, uh, who, um, uh, to uh, genomic scientists, and um, they argue that uh, the dichotomy uh, Lamarckian-Darwinian doesn't make any sense uh, anymore when you talk about uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, if you take, uh, if you make reference to genomic data. So, um, by, uh, this is not very interesting, you know, to say that there is a truly Lamarckian phenomenon. Uh, because what, what is, you know, my point is, how does it apply to culture? I've, I haven't got an idea because I'm not a cultural theorist. I, I'm supposed to be a philosopher, and so I, I don't know. But uh, what I see uh, are certain commonalities in between uh, biological and cultural processes. One is that many times they're both uh, based on hypermutation. So maybe uh, modeling cultural phenomena, we can take advantage of uh, all the work that, that has been done in uh, uh, microbiology. Often they are compositional and modular, and the example of the uh, spaghetti fork was meant in this way, and often they are uh, populational or social. And this is only the only thing I want to show, but uh, the point is that uh, uh, blind variation is, was a rough approximation of what uh, is actually biological reality. The second example is, again, gastronomical, and uh, this is, a, you know, I live in Chile, and this is the, uh, well, not the, the most traditional uh, food in Chile, uh, the national dish. It's called machas alla parmesana, machas are clams, and they've got parmesan on top something that in Italy would be a criminal offense, um, you know, mixing uh, uh, seafood and uh, a strong cheese like uh, Parmesan. I don't want to offend anyone. I mean, if you do something like this in Portugal, uh, it's not offense. I like it, okay? Uh, but, you know, uh, the point is about uh, vertical inheritance because this is a clear example of syncretism. The idea being that you mix traditions, you know, it's funny, funnily enough, the inventor of this dish was Italian, uh, apparently. But, you know, the idea of retention is vertical inheritance, which is, uh, you know, epitomized by the tree of thinking. And today I, I heard uh, in a previous talk that actually tree, the tree metaphor wasn't Darwinian in the end, but, you know, it was much before. I don't know if that is true or not. I don't want to offend Darwin and all the Darwinists here, but, you know, it doesn't matter. The point is that uh, maybe it was part of the uh, zeitgeist of the 18th century. And that is going to be, you know, the most uh, speculative uh, part of my talk uh, about the role of metaphors in science. But, uh, you know, what does it mean in culture? Um, I take this example, and uh, there was a presentation before that made reference to this uh, same paper. Take Eldridge and Temkin, uh, they try to reconstruct the history, which is known, of the brass wind cornet, and they conclude that uh, Darwinism cannot be applied to uh, cultural evolution just because, or, you know, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is this one. It's quite symptomatic, quite interesting, with the result that the tree will not necessarily branch dichotomous, uh, dichotomously, okay? So the assumption is that it must be a tree structure and it must be dichotomous branching. Now, I'm a, you know, I don't know what to say, but uh, I didn't know that uh, uh, the principle of, of dichotomy, I uh, recently read a paper by Oliver Ripple, who's a historian of cladistics and of systematics, and uh, he says that actually uh, the principle of dichotomy was uh, the application or misapplication of metaphor uh, by, on the part of uh, Hennig that was based on the belief of, you know, uh, Rudolf Carnap, a philosopher, and another German philosopher who, you know, who happened to know that the principle of dichotomy was the, it, it must be a universal law because uh, it's, uh, 
you know, exhibits the polarity of all being. And so dichotomy was assumed to be, uh, not by Darwin, of course, because uh, here we've got uh, trichotomies and uh, more than that. But, you know, uh, what I mean is that uh, you've got many, many metaphors that are uh, used in biology and uh, they assume they are reified and they become, you know, the truth. So if uh, they caught, if, uh, if, you know, uh, if an evolutionary process is not dichotomous, it doesn't really mean too much. It's uh, still natural, even though cladistics cannot, uh, you know, maybe with a little bit of, uh, um, well, it can work, yeah, of course. But my point is that the tree uh, metaphor has been um, criticized, uh, especially recently, given the fact that uh, there is a lateral gene transfer. Uh, in uh, prokaryotes, uh, and that is rampant. And so uh, different metaphors can be used. And one metaphor is the pangenome by uh, the microbiologist, Canadian microbiologist Sonea, who actually uh, uh, talks about uh, as well World Wide Web uh, in prokaryotes because they transfer information uh, without any kind of uh, uh, problem, basically public goods, and you know, there are many metaphorical expressions that you can use in order to understand these phenomena, and they actually bias, I think, uh, the um, working of the scientists. Uh, my last example, which is uh, maybe the most uh, mm, the craziest one in a way, so it is generally assumed that Darwin is, uh, uh, well, selection is the only naturalistic explanation Explication of design, explanation of design. Actually, explication, because it is an explication in a way. But, uh, you know, recently uh, there are many biologists, and again, I'm going to uh, focus on Kuhnin and uh, Michael Lynch and uh, uh, Gray and other people that uh, came out with this, uh, with this idea that, uh, you know, the idea is constructive neutral evolution. And the idea is that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, there is another way in which you can explain design. And, uh, you know, the, the metaphors that are used are quite different. And, for example, a metaphor by Gray et al. is uh, the idea of irremedi irremediable design, inevitable design, given the, uh, well, there is a mechanistic explanation, so it's still a naturalistic, uh, completely naturalistic explanation. It's not uh, uh, intelligent design at all. It's just, uh, you know, may, maybe poking fun to the idea of irreducible complexity, I guess. But the, the, the point is that there is a, uh, the, the role of drift, uh, the constructive role of drift, has been possibly underestimated in uh, biological practice. And what does it mean for, for culture? Again, I don't know, but uh, I was wondering whether the result, you know, if uh, cultural drift models are used or not. The only uh, reference to cultural drift no models I, I, I found in the literature, there is a paper by Shannon, and they explain, you know, um, the evolution of first names in the United States, uh, actually not a very, you know, let's say directional uh, in the sense of evolutionary uh, phenomenon. Uh, so I don't know if the assumption is that uh, drift is just a destructive force and nothing else. But uh, the work by these population biologists and uh, uh, by genomic scientists seems to uh, show that uh, drift has actually got a, a creative uh, role. So my conclusion, two conclusions. The first one is quite simple. You know, the idea is that you can uh, seek a general theory of selection, that was uh, what David Howe, the philosopher, tried to do in many papers. Or you can seek a general theory of evolution, uh, which is exactly what uh, Natalie is trying to do, if I interpret her correctly. Uh, David Hull himself was saying that if a theory of biological evolution is to be adequate, it must apply to both plants and animals. And of course, you've got to add all the other organisms that have been left, you know, uh, 
and in particular microorganisms that have, you know, evolutionary dynamics that are quite different. Uh, so you need to take into consideration all uh, organisms uh, without showing any kind of bias. So maybe I think the idea of Darwinizing culture that what Michael uh, referred to is actually, um, I think it's quite hopeless. Uh, the idea of biologizing culture is quite open, I would say, even though the word is just horrible. Um, and for me, the most in interesting aspect, and that's why I should have studied history instead of uh, philosophy, I think. But, you know, behind these metaphors, you always see, uh, you know, something, you know, very interesting, I would say. The idea of slot machines and lucky jackpots and the analogies and metaphors that were used by Salvador Luria in order to uh, understand the phenomena of uh, the nature of variation was a direct attempt to expand completely the idea of uh, the issue of teleology immediately. I mean, a machine cannot work if not in a performed way, okay? The idea of tree of life uh, and the alternative ideas of pangenomes and public goods are an answer, you know, a metaphorical answer to the problem of the nature of inheritance, but they've got a completely different perspective as far as the question of the emergence of, emergence of cooperation is involved. Clearly, pangenomes and public goods, uh, you know, sort of start from the assumption that cooperation is a basic feature of uh, the biological world that doesn't need a primitive feature that doesn't need uh, some kind, you know, a kind of explanation. But maybe that is going to, a little bit too far. And as far as the origin of adaptation and the connected issue of progress, I mean, Darwin was talking about artificial selection. Somebody else uh, was talking about the blind watchmaker. Irreducible complexity, irremediable complexity, genomic syndromes. Uh, this is the idea of Conin that uh, you know complexity is actually the result of a genomic genomic syndrome. All these metaphors uh, capture you know part of the zeitgeist again. You know I don't know German enough. This is the only word, but uh, I like it and so. Uh, and that is very interesting. So I think historians have got some, a lot of work to do here. Uh, and being a philosopher, I try to emulate historians, uh, trying to understand what happens in biology and trying to apply it to culture. Uh, I don't know if I'm successful, but uh, I just wanted to give this talk. And so that's all. Thank you. <laughs>